I do not appreciate you killing my men. Also, when I sent my people to kill your people for killing my people, you killed more of my people. Not cool. Not fucking cool. You have no fucking idea how not fucking cool that shit is. What? I think you're gonna be up to speed here shortly. Yeah. You are so gonna regret crossing me in a few minutes. Fuck yeah, you are. What is up, YouTube? Live via satellite here, and today we are talking Kingdom Manga Chapter 584. Alright guys, so yeah, that was a pretty intense chapter of Kingdom, wasn't it? But before we move into this week, guys, I have some cleanup, some housekeeping that we have to do from last week. It had been brought to my attention that I had been screwing up. All last week, and pretty much every chapter before this, I've been saying Kane's name improperly. So, you guys know me. I value pronunciation. I am not one to say someone's name improperly. I mean, if you've been listening for a while, you know I am the king of pronunciation. So that's why I think that this warning is something that Kyle Kai should take seriously. So, it wasn't supposed to be Kane, it was supposed to be Kane, eh? And thanks to the guys who pointed this out, because proper pronunciation is key. And if you didn't think it was important, well, you're in for a rude awakening. L! Yeah, four L's! Pick that up, turn it over, lay it down right over that London trip down there. Wow, okay. Can I solve? Oh, well, that'd be a good idea, yeah. <laughs> Mythological Hero Achilles. I can't accept that. Okay. Alright, so the chapter picks up a little before we left off last week, and we see that we're in a heat of battle right now, specifically the battle between Ohan and Chigaryu. And Ohan notices that Chigaryu's core army is attacking their right, which he knows they need to address, but Banyo volunteers to go because he believes that Ohan's presence is needed there. And after agreeing with Banyo and telling him to take 400 men with him over to the right, he then pauses and tells Banyo to wait, giving him the warning to be careful, because it's Chigaryu himself who's making the move on the right, telling him not to do anything reckless and that if things get dangerous, he'll be the first one to come to his aid. Now, I don't know about you all, but when I read this, it sure felt like a death flag to me. It actually reminds me of the time when Gune and Akko were having a very similar conversation when they were under attack by Giyun and Banaji, and we all know how that turned out. It was at this moment he knew. He fucked up. But Banyo also cautions Ohan because he believes that if Shigaru's making a move this early, then he's definitely probably up to something. Which Ohan agrees with, saying that he knows. Then we move over to Shin's battlefield, and it looks like Giyun is doing a similar tactic to Chigaryu where he is attacking Shin's right side. But unlike the Gyokoho unit, there's not too much need for concern because on that right side lies Lieutenant Kyokai. And Kyokai, seeing that Giyun is possibly headed their way, gets one of the most savage looks I've ever seen from her in a while. And how she's even telling her troops that when Giyun does arrive, to somewhat guide his direction towards her, because in her mind, she already plans to slay Giyun. Sometimes you can forget just how dangerous this woman is. But all of Kyokai's bloodlust is interrupted by the sudden appearance of another army, and this army is coming from even further to the right. And while everyone's wondering where this army could have possibly come from, they all soon realize that these men are actually the Gakue army from the neighboring battlefield. And these guys look hell bent at avenging their master Gakue, and either their eyes are filled with the rage of their master's death, or their bloodshot from the sleepless nights they've had recalling Gakue's half a body sailing through the air. And while everybody's wondering what the Aku army is doing by letting the Gakue army free like this, Ten picks up the fact that the Gakue army is actually acting as reserves behind the Banaji army. And she curses the fact that now of all times, the Zao have actually started to work together. But Kyokai, in response to the Gakue army, quickly has her infantry form up walls. 
And even though the Gakue army thought they were going to break through, we see just how confident Kiyokai is in her men and their training as they pull off a chain Goriki, sending the Gakue army flying through the air, clearly in tribute to their master. And the rookies looking on from the other side of the battlefield are very impressed because this Goriki is nothing like what they did in the previous battle, showing a distinct difference between Kiyokai's well-trained authentic Goriki and the rookies knockoff version. Ten and her men, even though wowed by this feat, still realize that this won't be enough to hold them off and they still actually need to send them some help. But Ten doesn't want to make a move until Shin does because that'll lead their formation with too many holes. But strangely enough, she's shocked to find out that Shin's actually doing nothing at all. Over at Shin, we see that even though his men think that he should go and help Kiyokai, we see that all of a sudden he has no clue what the enemy's actually aiming for. But the one thing he does know is that they're not going for Kiyokai. And the reason he's able to tell this is because Kiyun would have been oozing with bloodlust when he was on his way towards Kyokai. But since Shin's instincts didn't pick up anything, he knows that Kyokai is not his target. So even though he has no clue what he's aiming for, the one thing he knows is that they need to keep their eyes on Kiyun. And on cue, it looks like the guy who was responsible for keeping his eyes on Kiyun has suddenly lost track of him. Come on Hoba, you have to do better. Even the babies are one of the most dangerous animals in the world, so I built this cage to keep them secure so there's no possible- Oh my god! Then over at the Benanji army, we get a little tidbit that the Aku army is still holding up and mainly because of Akakin. And even though that was a nice little nugget of information, the shocking thing here is we see that Giyun has a small detachment of men passing behind the Benanji army. And here's where we flash back to the night before when Kane- Damn it! And here's where we flash back to the night before when Kayane was giving out Roboku's plan to the others, and we find out that the reason they targeted Ohan was for two reasons. One is that even though the units were pretty much equal in accomplishments, the Heishin unit has a numbers advantage, being that they're 8,000 strong compared to the Gyokuho unit's 5,000, which means the Gyokuho unit's pushing themselves a bit harder. And the second reason is, being that Giyun is an instinctual general, Shin is actually able to read his moves, whereas Ohan, who is yet to actually face him, won't be able to. So in other words, the Zhao's plan is for Giyun to be the one to take Ohan's head. And we see that they pulled off a pretty nifty maneuver to be able to get this done. Because once Giyun moved to the right, the only reason the Gakue army made an attack on the Heishin unit from the right was to serve as a distraction to hide Giyun's true objective as he passed behind the Banaji army over to Ohan's side of the battlefield. Over at Ohan, we see that his men are quick to pick up on this small detachment coming their way. But at the moment, they have no clue to who this actually is. Some even think it's members of the Gakue army. But Ohan does still give the order to form a wall. And being that it's such a small force of two to 400 men, the members of the Gyokoho unit on this wall plan to stop this detachment right here and now. But unfortunately for them, this group of about 300 men just happened to be Giyun's elite crack troops, the Ryun Cavalry. And this group of men aren't just strong, they may actually be the strongest group on the entire Sukai Plains. And this is made evident as they are easily able to break through the Gyokoho unit's defenses. And as Ohan's starting to realize that this just isn't any ordinary force, he sends out the order to get Kanjo, but soon after realizes that he probably wouldn't make it in time. Lucky for him though, Kanjo actually understanding the situation moved before the order was even given. And with the Kanjo unit now in position, they begin their brutal showdown with the Ryun Cavalry. But as that was going on, we see another small detachment of a few dozen men moving in what could only be described as an arch, weaving delicately through the gaps left between the incoming reinforcements, silently drawing closer and closer to Ohan's HQ. And even though members of Ohan's HQ noticed this small detachment and went to engage the enemy, it was already too late because this group was actually being led by the 10 Spears, the 10 best warriors out of the already elite Ryun Cavalry, stating that these 10 men were truly the cream of the crop. And not only that, but behind this lethal spearhead was none other than Giyun himself. And that was the chapter in a nutshell, guys. All right, guys, so to me, that was an amazing chapter of Kingdom. I really enjoyed this one and mainly because of the tactics in it. I really thought the Zhao came up with a very, very clever plan. Like, that was pretty, pretty good. I mean, every part of this plan works so smoothly to isolate Ohan. First one, you have Chigaryu attack and it pulls Banyo to the right. Then the whole elaborate distraction to get Giyun onto Ohan's battlefield. But then even after arriving, having even more of Ohan's strong forces like the Kanjo unit, 
engaged with and doing all they can just to hold off the Ryun cavalry, while gi finishes off the plan using his instincts to weave his way all the way up to Ohan's HQ. I mean, this was flawless execution, and there's definitely going to be some repercussions by allowing gi to get in this far. Now, obviously, to me, the biggest death flag definitely seems to be hanging over Banyo's head, because earlier in the chapter, when Ohan sent him to the right, he does mention that if Banyo gets in trouble, he'll be the first one to come to his aid. The problem is here, I think Ohan's going to be way too busy facing off against gi to be able to help Banyo if he does get in trouble. And to be honest, to me, Banyo versus Chigaru doesn't seem like it would be too much of a fight. But you never know, Banyo may surprise us and last a bit longer than we think. I don't think Har would send him off without him being able to achieve something. But if he does go out, like we said in the last review, I'm sure Ohan kind of sees him as like a father figure. So we'll definitely have to see how he copes with this if he's not put out of commission himself. But another thing that was great to see this chapter was that Har actually bought back the Ryon Cavalry and the 10 spears that he had mentioned earlier in the arc. We initially saw the Ryon introduced back in chapter 541 and the 10 spears were briefly bought up in chapter 543. So it's really nice to see them actually bought back into the story, but not only that, actually playing a significant role. And when it comes to Shin's chapter, it looks like he was able with his instincts to sniff out that the Zao were up to something, but we'll have to see next week if he's able to actually make it to Ohan in time to actually give him some help because in order to make it, he probably had to start moving not too long after gi set off. And even though a lot of things happened in this chapter and there are a lot of standout moments, I don't think anything stood out more than Kiyokai this chapter. And even though she didn't have like a humongous role in this chapter or anything, the little that we did see of her was so badass. It was like, can we get more of this please? But yeah guys, even though this was a really great chapter, that's pretty much all I got because the story really didn't progress much further than what we already knew was gonna be happening. So with that being said, let's move on to the comment of the week. And this week's comment comes from Thomas Summer. And what he has to say is, what if Hoken appears in the next chapter? And that's why Ohan gets defeated. Okay, so I've been meaning to actually talk about this subject a little bit. And I don't think Hoken's going to be appearing in the next chapter, nor do I think that Hoken's going to appear in the rest of this particular arc. And what I mean by that is, it looks like Har is breaking up the conquest of Zhao into a couple of parts. Right now, everything we've gone through up to this point is just to conquer Gyo. And once that happens, I think that ends this particular arc. After that, however, I think we'll be moving into part two of the Zhao invasion. And from that point forward is when I actually expect Hoken to be a major part of the story. And not even just Hoken, but all three of the great heavens. And if you have no clue what I mean about that, definitely check out this other video I did a while back. I'll leave a card at the top of the screen and that'll better explain it for you because I don't wanna to get too in depth with it right here because that would make this video a lot longer than it needs to be. But anyway, guys, that about does it for this week's review. Let me know what you guys thought of the chapter in the comments section below. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video and feel free to share, comment, and subscribe. Peace out.